Boss, it doesn't seem like anyone's sitting in the backyard today. No. But it's too hot. It's too hot. Ellen's <laughs> right. Every once in a while, for our morning meetings, every once in a while, we get somebody that's sitting in their backyard enjoying their coffee. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right now, Foss is enjoying what your popsicle, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> you can tell. That's the only reason I'm quiet, Alvin. <laughs> There's Miss Hawaii out there. I see Chris Chun. Hello. Yes, I am here. All right. I'm here. Representing HR. Yep, and it's a beautiful day in Hawaii, Maine. Hawaii out there. The Big Island. Alvin, who I forgot who you're gonna have in the morning as as guest speaker at Project Management. Oh, uh, we're gonna have John Matsinski. He's from John New Horizon. Matsinski, that's right. Yeah. That's right. We've been talking about WIOA and uh, certifications and training and such. That's what his company does. But he's gonna talk about the course opportunities that now if you're unemployed or laid off. Yeah. You have an opportunity to uh, enhance your training and certifications. Big blessing for a lot of people. Bob Kerr. Hey Bob. Hey Foster, how are you? I am blessed to be kicking, is what my dad used to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Even though your brother-in-law failed you. What'd you say? Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a couple of minutes after three, so we might as well get started. And uh, this is John Luce. And uh, I think I've got everything where it's supposed to be. But um, welcome to our fourth session in the series of the career transit, the Frisco Career Transition Workshop. Um, this is the fourth session. We will have, uh, I believe, three more. Um, Rex can correct me on that as we go down the road, because I, I have never prepared a script for these meetings. I just do it ad hoc. So um, I want to welcome you today. Um, uh, our subject is salary negotiation in this COVID-19 situation. Uh, and uh, well, I hope you uh, get a lot of benefit out of it. Uh, Rex certainly is uh, an expert to share on those, uh, those things. I certainly am not. Uh, so here's how the, the next uh, 90 minutes is going to proceed. Um, if, my, if my computer will work. First of all, as I've done on all these meetings, I just want everybody who participates to be aware that this event is being recorded. It is also currently running live on Facebook on the Career DFW um, page and the recording will remain on the Career DFW page and after this meeting later today or tomorrow morning it, it will be uh, posted on YouTube under the Career USA channel on YouTube for others to view in the future. So we want you to be aware of that because by participating in the event we want you to be aware if you post comments in the chat box or you uh, have your microphone or camera on and you make comments, uh, you're uh, giving consent for your comments, name and picture to appear on those platforms. So uh, we don't feel that should be a problem for most people because uh, we're dealing with professionals who are, are being their professional best, but we just want you to be aware of it. Uh, I want you to know going forward that if you wanna ask a question, uh, during the presentation. Uh, if you're on Zoom, please use the chat box to enter your question. We'd ask that you begin your text with a question mark so we instantly know it's a question and not a comment. 
And uh, after the presentation, the uh, pa expert panel uh, will be able to answer most of your questions. I will be moderating the panel section of this uh, presentation after Rex uh, gives, shares his information. And um, I will be watching for comments on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, we would ask that you enter your question in the comment field uh, that Facebook uses. And also, please type the question mark first so we know it's an inquiry and, and it's not just a comment that you're sharing with the audience. So today's agenda, uh, we have a message of encouragement from uh, uh, Pastor Steve Fisher. We have the presentation by Rex Sowett. We'll then have at the end of the meeting, a Q and A with our expert panel. And then we will uh, give you a, an update on next week's presentation. Um, so uh, again, a message of encouragement will be given by Steve Fisher. He's the lead pastor of Care Ministries at Stonebar Community Church, who hosts our career transition workshop when we can do it in person. Uh, they've been a wonderful host and sponsor for us. Uh, we're not an official ministry of the church, uh, but they certainly do have a heart for our reach outreach to people who are seeking employment uh, because it's a it's a very uh, it's a necessity it's a need and Steve serves on a team that provides hope for those who are broken discouraged hurting uh, disappointed and uh, he does a marvelous uh, job at that um, then we're going to go to Rex um, who is going to give us um, some information on new salary and negotiation strategies during the COVID-19 period uh, Rex is a human resources manager, and uh, he's been at the director level uh, in recruitment and staffing. He's currently at JAARS, and um, I'll let him uh, explain that acronym uh, when Rex takes the takes the screen. Okay, so our panel today uh, originally. Uh, we mustered uh, Rex, of course, Lori Davis, uh, who is a recruitment expert, Foster Williams, who most of you know, uh, the head of Career Search Network, and uh, Jeff Morris, who's the uh, owner and uh, propagator of Career DFW, which is a wonderful resource for those who are in the search for employment. I just recently got a message that Foster may be able to join us for part of this meeting, but he has an, an appointment he has to make at four o'clock central time. So he may not be with us for the expert panel, but we will have Rex, Lori, and Jeff, three uh, marvelous resources for any questions you may have. So that is the agenda for this, for this afternoon. So we're going to go right now to Steve. Hi, Fisher. my name is Steve Fisher, and I am the pastor of Care Ministries at Stonebriar Community Church. They've given me an opportunity today to um, take a few moments, say a few words that I pray encourage you, uh, that uh, perhaps make you think. And as a, as a result of that thinking, uh, you move one step forward. They say the game of life is played between the ears. How we think drives what we feel, ultimately drives what we do. Um, if you're a, a Christian, um, you understand that pattern for our, I believe that's the pattern that um, our Bible talks about. Uh, there are so many scriptures that um, encourage you, uh, sort of uh, ask you to think about what you're thinking about. Think on these things that are good and right. Take each thought captive by the renewing of our mind. And there are more that um, focus us on what we are thinking because our creator knows that how we think drives what we feel, drives what we do. I also believe that there is a, um, a force, if you will, an enemy, actually, that is um, constantly pressing down upon us. Um, it, it's like gravity. You can't see it, 
that there are 30 plus pounds of gravity at all time pressing down on us. I think this force is much heavier than gravity. And I believe it's just as real, even though we can't see it. So what I want to do is um, perhaps challenge you or encourage you perhaps um, to take some moments during this season of your life to consider what you think about. For I do believe um, that this enemy uh, that uh, Christians call um, Satan, the devil, um, that's pressing on us to keep us down, um, has an ultimate goal, and that is destruction. Um, for those who believe in Christ, um, I believe he can never rob us of our salvation, but he can make our life, our sanctification, a much more difficult path. And so it's incumbent upon us to listen to our Holy Spirit and to think what you're thinking about. I know in these times, I found myself not thinking, I just react. I just keep reacting. And then I don't think. So because we know the enemy's ultimate goal is destruction, I want to back out and identify five or so patterns of thinking, and it's nice and convenient. Um, they all begin with Ds. So these five or six Ds ultimately are designed to corrupt our thinking to gain the end goal of destruction by the enemy. Again, not our salvation, but our time here on this earth. So the first one I think is, um, is discouragement. You are discouraged. Unfortunately, our God, our truth, our Bible, we have the opposite to counter. Every bit of force that presses us down, there's a truth that lifts us up. And so the first again is discouraged. It didn't turn out the way that I thought it was going to be. Our Bible tells us that because of what Christ did for us, um, and because um, God measures our steps, that it's not over till it's over. You may be discouraged, but that doesn't mean that you're done, because I believe God is still shaping and molding uh, you for the next phase of your life, the next steps of your life. But we also get distracted. I think it's a clear tool of that enemy. He distracts us. We begin thinking about the things perhaps that aren't as significant, but it feels like we're thinking about things. So he allows us to play over here and avoid the really tough things sometimes. Um, there's that uh, uh, little colloquialism where you're thinking about and then you see a squirrel and you look to a squirrel, right? That, that, that says we're easily distracted. And that works in the enemy's favor because then we don't focus on the things that are really important. Keep the major things, the big things important. Sometimes we've got to ask, okay, what is important to me? So we can have that ability to not be distracted. Sometimes the enemy's thinking causes us to feel diminished. Um, that's a lot where shame comes in that we just aren't what we thought we are, or more importantly, what other people thought we are. But you've got to remember, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And that there is no ability for anyone else to diminish you, to cause you to be less than, because of who you are. Because who you are transcends what you do. Yes, I'm a realist. Mr. MasterCard and Mr. Visa surely want me to be working too. I get it. But there's a core, there's a soul inside that I don't ever want people to walk through this world diminished 
when there's a truth. And we as believers need to, to look for that and support people and encourage. That's why I love what this workshop does, especially when we're all together, right? The power of people, the presence of people remind us that we still have worth and we still have value. Another one is, um, is distorted. We can think that what we're doing is really, really important. And, and we can chase those things that we think are really, really important. And I'll let you fill in the blank for what it is for you. I know what it is for me. And those things invariably end up not being the truth of Scripture. Not being the truth of what God says is really important. And that's people. It's relationships. That's helping one another. That, that's caring for each other. That's what's really important. But we can so get distorted. We can so get locked in that we forget to hug our wife, to hug our husband, to take a minute with our kids, to send a letter of encouragement to somebody. And, and finally, there's disappointment. That again, internally, we keep thinking I am no good and I will never amount to anything because I have failed apparently there's a there's a strength it's called perseverance it's re resilience endurance that's what our our bible talks about that's what god helps you with is how to persevere how to endure how to have resilience to not be disappointed to realize your story again is still being written we are unfinished works I have a, a painting in my office and it's just the background and um, one of our, our special needs adults uh, in our anthem art class w was painting and um, I, I stopped in and I said hey can, can I have that painting and she was just as sweet and just as precious as she could be and she said oh pastor I'm not, I'm not done yet I said no honey that's beautiful just as it is and she gave it to me and she signed it and I have it in my office hanging on the wall right above the chair that somebody else sits in across from where I sit when I'm praying with them or talking with them. And every time I look at someone who's come into my office, who's bearing a heavy burden, a heavy weight, I can look up at that and I can remember what that is. That's an unfinished work. And so is that person. And so are you. So am I. So... My encouragement today is to guard your thoughts. Um, if you're discouraged, if you're distracted, if you feel diminished, if you've chased a distorted end and you ultimately are disappointed, those are not truth. Those are not truth. Because if we think that way, our feelings will be driven towards less than thinking. We will be down. We will not have the energy. We will not have the fight. And therefore, our actions will fall out of that feeling. So if I'm thinking that I have been diminished, I am feeling a bunch of shame. I'm not going to act in a way that is confident, the way that is um, uh, using the gifts and talents that you've been given. So I don't know where you are today. I know where I am, and sometimes I don't like thinking about things but I do find a consistency when I'm not feeling good therefore I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to do I can trace it back to a thought to a thought that is keeping me down so today before you go to bed tonight take a moment examine your thoughts and if they're full of these types of thoughts that I shared Perhaps it's time to, to pray to a God to say help. Perhaps it's time to talk to somebody. Don't sit in these thoughts alone. Because the only thing worse than being in a bad place is being in a bad place alone. There's help. There's a way through this. You know, we can never change the past, but we can reframe it. We can look at it differently. So be encouraged today because you're an unfinished work. Your story is not written. There are more steps for you to take. Um, that's truth. 
So again, I hope your, uh, uh, your session today is wonderful. And um, I am grateful for the opportunity just to share a few words. So have a great day and uh, hopefully we'll see you later. Well, okay. Um, thank you, Pastor Steve. Um, I want to take a moment when he talked about helping each other and whatnot, I want to take a note, a moment to acknowledge the uh, Frisco Career Transition Workshop team. Uh, of course, Rex Sowett, who is one of the founders, along with Gail Houston, who helped found this uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, Locke Alderson, who uh, we've heard from in the past and we'll hear from him again. Gail Bridgman, who's a regular part of this team. Uh, Lori Davis, um, who will be with us today on the panel. Foster Williams, the ever-present Foster Williams, who, uh, God bless him, um, covers a lot of ground every week, uh, helping different groups and whatnot. Uh, Jeff Morris, who's been uh, just a wonderful supporter of this workshop, as well as all the different activities that go around in the DFW area. And then from Stonebriar Community Church, Steve Fisher, who you just heard from, Karen Hawkins, who does a lot of behind the scenes work uh, in coordinating activities and helping us to get these presentations together, as well as Jean Allen, uh, who does, uh, along with Karen, a lot of work in the background. We don't see Karen and Jean and Steve much, but they're back there supporting us, helping us get things done, putting things together, helping with schedules, uh, facilities and things like that. So I will just want to give a shout out to the whole Frisco Career Transition team uh, because there's uh, a lot of wonderful people who spend a lot of hours uh, putting these different events together. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, let you listen to uh, live on Zoom and on Facebook is listen to Rex Sowett talking about strategies for salary neg uh, and negotiation. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, give it to, over to you now. Okay, Rex. Okay. Thank you, John. Let me, uh, let me get my shared screen up. Okay. Can people see that? Maybe not. Not, not right yet. yet. No. Not yet. No. Okay. Hold on one. Let me, uh, let me get to that shared screen one more time. Okay. Okay. I'm popping up my slide set right now. And should be there in just 10 seconds. Close that. Can, can people see my screen? I, I, I'm, I'm having, it looks like I'm having some difficulties getting to. Yeah, no shared screen right now, Rex. Okay. So now there you go. There you go, Rex. It's there you go. How about that? You go. Okay. And, and I, I want to, uh, I, I, I want to, is there a good uh, way to do that? Or can, can people just see this? Is that okay? Yeah, if you go up to uh, slide, if you go up to the, yeah, you were just slideshow. Slideshow. Open yeah. that, click on that. And from beginning. Okay, so, thank you so much. Huh? There you go. Okay, okay better everyone? All right. Um, uh, everyone, I'm going to, uh, start this presentation 
very quickly and I'm gonna gain speed uh, as I go. I'm gonna turn it back to John uh, at, uh, I'm trying to get it to him by four o'clock. So basically in this session, what I would like to do is to go over um, uh, what sort of effects that COVID-19 is showing with salary uh, strategies and negotiations, what are companies thinking when they're looking at hot putting hiring uh, offers in front of the candidate. Uh, the second part of this presentation, we'll start talking about uh, advanced salary strategies and negotiation practices. So that's what I'm looking at right now. Uh, specifically, uh, and I, I'm moving my screen so that I can take a look at this screen a little bit better. Basically, how, how has the pandemic made the salary negotiation harder to know, tougher to see, and harder to read. So with all of that, how do I adapt and how? I'm gonna go over the changes that, uh, that I'm observing uh, in the market right now. Uh, number one, one of the things that I think a lot of people are doing is that they're, they're preparing pretty well and trying to understand the competitive market data that's guiding the, the type of salaries that people are looking for. Because of the pandemic, it's not so good now. This market data is not that great right now because over the last three or four months when this pandemic has hit, it has really, really jacked the compensation market up right now. There are major shifts that are occurring in compensation structures. If that's the case, there's major shifts in internal database salary, which makes external salaries that everyone on this call, or most of the people on this call, are looking at resulting in COVID-19. Rex, give me an example of something like this. Um, with a very, very large movie entertainment company. It's the number two movie entertainment company uh, in the United States. It's number two to AMC. That company is called uh, Regal Entertainment. They terminated every person underneath the director level in that organization. Does that affect their internal uh, database structure? The answer to that is yes. Will that affect salary offers? The answer to that is yes. I'm also seeing tremendous shifts in compensation for airlines and aviation. A lot of people have been laid off and a lot of executives are getting cut. And because of that, your salary offer should be uh, the intelligence in understanding what sort of salaries are out there uh, is something that you have to research more. My recommendation is to get at least four data points for the type of salaries that you want. I've put five sources in there. Salary.com is the one I like the best that I've, I've recommended for years and years and years. Glassdoor has some very, very good data for salaries. I like Payscale. It's used by a lot of Fortune 500 companies. CareerBuilder is a classic source of getting compensation information for positions that you want and Indeed is coming up very, very strong over the last two or three years with a lot, of, a lot of data. My recommendation to the team, look for at least for these four uh, sources, and I'm going to give you one more tip. Ask your network. Ask people that are looking for positions that you are looking for and ask them, how, what does it look like out there? Are you noticing offers that are being um, submitted by companies much lower than you think, okay? The, ch the second ch that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing is that I want you to be much, much more skeptical about the job that you're looking for. Let me tell you what I'm, I'm, I'm meaning by that. Um, a lot of people, including myself, I've been laid off five times. When, when one takes a look at 
an economy that lays off this many people this fast and no economy in the United States history has laid off this many people this fast. I want you to take a look at the job posting specifically with essential duties of the job. What I want you to take a look at is, is that job being super, what I call supersized or does it look like the function is really, really grown? The reason why I say this is that have a lot of people been laid off? The absolute positive answer to that question is yes, a lot of people get laid off. What happens when people get laid off? The people that are there or need to be hired next, guess what happens to their position? It grows. It becomes much bigger in responsibilities. There are, there are a lot more what I call hybrid positions available in the position because uh, people are, are looking at bring on individuals and their positions that they're uh, going for, they have to make that job much, much bigger than before because guess what? That position now has to maybe do as many as one or two more responsibilities or job duties in that one position, okay? I want you to do this. I want you to ask the recruiter or the hiring manager, if you get that interview, if, if there is, uh, if, if this position has been added over, uh, if the responsibilities have been added over the last 90 days, and what are those major new responsibilities? I want you to also ask the recruiter or hiring manager, are there any projects assigned that were new positions that are quote unquote midstream. Again, the situation that we're at, we laid off or corporate laid off a lot of people. Uh, and understanding the position, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. If, if there are any projects that you have to take over in midstream, does that make it a harder job or an easier job? That makes it a harder job. Absolutely makes it a harder job. You can leverage that information as you start taking a look at uh, salary negotiation. Okay. Pardon me. I'm going. Uh, let me share with you some information that I'm seeing with internal pay reductions. And uh, let me give let me give attribute to this. The source uh, is the Securities and Exchange Commission via Gallagher Christmas and Gray April 2020 analysis. Public companies are turning to, to uh, pay reductions rather than layoffs with this pandemic, okay? Of 100, the, the source, 151 companies in the analysis, 143 reported pay reductions uh, for at least their CEO. And I've given additional information on what that, uh, on, on the effects of those reductions. I want to point to two bullet points that we have here. 16% of those reductions were for salaried employees. Looking at the people on the call, the, most of the people I believe are looking for salary positions. So what I get out of this analysis is that the salaries offered for new employees are going to be less, depending on that company. Uh, good news, 66, two thirds of the companies are saying that the reductions are gonna be temporary or uh, uh, temporary in the time period without assigning a, 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 a time, okay? Um, if People are looking at the industries that I've listed below. These industries have been severely affected by the pandemic. And, and I believe not having any information has forced these companies to lower their salary offers for incoming new hires. The hospitality space, retail, airline and aviation, travel and transportation, and conglomerate. Um, I'll give you an example, travel and transportation services. People have probably heard of the bankruptcy with Hertz. With retail, 
a lot of a lot of major players are leaving the market. Some players that you think you would never leave the market, such as J.C. Penney. Okay. Um, this affects if you are looking at any sort of jobs or companies in these sectors. My expectation is, gee, maybe their maybe these individual salary offers for new hires are going to be um, lower than what you might be seeing in other organizations or market spaces. Okay. Um, Rex, what are some industries that you think are not being as effective uh, as affected? Uh, what sort of companies would uh, would those be? Uh, I think Big Four is going to still offer very competitive salaries. Um, DOD contractors, uh, uh, good salaries. Their salaries, I don't think, will be affected. Uh, oil and energy, it depends. Uh, oil and energy got really, really affected. The message in this is look at the industry that you're applying for and just start thinking in your mind, do I think that that uh, organization or that industry was affected significantly by the pandemic? Okay. Here are the new COVID-19 questions that I'd like. Everyone has questions to ask at the, at the end of the interview, question comes up, do you have any questions? I want you to start thinking of these new questions that might be related to COVID. Number one, is the, is the position a new position or a replacement position. If it's, if it's a new position, keep this in mind, a lot of people lost their jobs that were managers and uh, people may not get the coaching, mentoring or leadership that they need coming into a new position. Um, is the hiring manager new in their new role? Uh, the second bullet is very, very similar to the first bullet. If the new hiring manager is new in their role, that generally means that uh, their mentorship skills, support skills, uh, training skills aren't as, uh, aren't as good. Find out how the position success is going to be managed in the first or measured in the first 90 days. Why 90 days? That's your probationary period. You need to know this. What three critical projects or initiatives are going to be assigned in the first 90 days? So many positions now are remote. Um, I'm believing that as states are lifting their stay at home, Texas is one of the states that are, is, is, is the best state for opening up their state uh, uh, their state uh, economy. Uh, I'm in North Carolina. North Carolina does not is is not opening up its state economy real real well. But uh, if this is a remote position, um, there's it gives you some advantage because you don't have to take a look at gas or fuel to get to that organization or that office. And are the other key members of the team remote? Is it tougher to manage or to, to do your job with key members of the team remote? In a lot of ways, the answer to that could be yes. So knowing if, you're, if your other key members of your team are remote and knowing that, I think, lays into your strategy for, uh, uh, for salary as well. Let me go over what I think are fundamental winning practices in salary and negotiation. Um, when you start the salary negotiation, having two virtues or competencies will carry you. One is your preparedness and the other one is, is, is ownership. I want you to, uh, a, a, of all of this, of all of the process steps that I've seen in your job search, which is job search strategy, resume writing, interview taking, networking, 
this step of salary negotiation can be the most personal step and the most emotional step in the process. But I want to encourage you that this might be the most controllable part of the interview process. And let me show you why, okay? Here's what people don't wanna get into, at least two things. I, I call it the hard lose position. The candidate doesn't wanna give a salary expectation that eliminates you from a job or the interview process because your salary expectation is too high. So because your salary expectation is too high, they don't interview you, they don't offer you the, uh, the, uh, uh, the position, you don't get to accept the job offer. On the other hand, you don't wanna give the opportunity uh, for the employer to lowball you. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why this step is so hard. 73% of the respondents per monster says that salary is not the number two, not the number three, but the most important consideration in, the, uh, in, in accepting the job offer. Okay. What I encourage you to do is to understand this. Recruiters, including Lori, myself, Jeff, um, will ask you very, very early in the, uh, in the hiring or interviewing process, what are your salary expectations? I ask you, that I'll, I'll, I'll let people know, I will ask you this question within the first 10 minutes of my talking to you if I'm recruiting you or talking to you about an opening. Um, this, this question can start off in a lot of ways. What are you making now? What are you looking for in salary? What are your salary requirements? What did you earn last year? What was your bonus? What was your commission? What was your incentive? How much did you pay for monthly premiums for your health care? All of these things are questions that I need to know to go forward. Why? Because I don't want to waste your time. And because my manager has told me that they have a budget position or they, they have a budget amount for every position. And because of that, I have to report to that hiring manager. John Luce was a hiring manager and he would tell, he would tell his recruiters, Rex, I need, to I need to only pay 58K for this position. So be very, uh, be ready, be prepared to answer this question with a lot of conviction, okay? If, I, if there's one slide that I really want you to understand and to have in your arsenal of thinking is that I want you to, des to design a salary strategy that does two things, maximizes your flexibility of getting your offer, but raises the upside leverage that you have in accepting a higher offer or the highest offer that you can get. Let me tell you how this works. Too many people, too many candidates will, when I ask them, what salary are you looking for? They will give me a rate of pay. Rex, what I'm looking for is $82,000 a year, okay? At that point in time, you have now boxed yourself with a number that as a recruiter, I can leverage that against you. I can tell I can I can tell that manager he's only looking for 82 and guess what I want you to do is I want you to think of range not rate I want you to give a range that gives a minimum to maximum of salary expectation to the hiring manager what do I mean by that I, I give an, uh, an example statement there my salary uh, my salary range is low 70s to high 90 level, 90K level, and saying this as well, depending on the understanding of the role and the package and the benefits package better. Uh, better. Um, if you get an offer at the high end, which is 90K, are you satisfied? The answer to that is yes the high end takes care of itself. 
it's the low end that you have to really, really invest some time and thinking on what you want to tell the, um, the recruiter. When I listen to you guys and you tell me my, my range is 70K to 90K to mid 90K level, what do I hear? The recruiter psychology is that I hear 70K. I can get you for 71K. I can get you for 72K. I want you to think of the last part of that uh, statement, depending on understanding the role and benefits package better. The understanding of the role guess what? Most roles, as you start talking to the hiring manager, does it get smaller or does it get more complex? It gets more complex. It gets harder. You start thinking, oh my gosh, this is not what the job description said. And, and by the way, for the people that are in HR, like uh, Cindy, who understands job descriptions, most job descriptions right now are obsolete. Okay. I, th that's, Organizations change, job titles change, job responsibilities change, job descriptions change. And generally, job descriptions are not as updated as they need to be. So you need to understand what the role, scope, success, responsibilities, qualifications of that role, and you have to understand the benefits package that they're offering. Um, why is benefits important? For, for the most lucrative salary offer that you get, the benefits package should be uh, approximately 22 to 33% of total compensation. And people who have been on COBRA now know what benefits cost, okay? Um, you can ask, guess what? You can ask questions in the, uh, in, in the uh, in the salary negotiation as well. Let's say you give your salary uh, strategy statement. My salary range is this. My maximum is this. The candidate, your response next is, based on this, comp uh, this compensation that I'm giving you, this compensation range that I'm giving you, is this in line with the budget approved for this opportunity? That recruiter is going to do one of two things. They're going to uh, either trust you as a relationship partner, or they're not going to give you this information at all. If you ask me this information, I will be straight with you. And Lori Davis will be straight with you because she's a great recruiter. Foster Williams will be straight with you because he's that, that, uh, that uh, great recruiter. Um, if your compensation range is above what the, uh, uh, what the approval for this position is, uh, a good recruiter will say, yes, it is. You're in the range, okay? Or they're gonna say, and I've, I've said this many, 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 many times. No, you're not in the range. Would you consider high 60s? And it's your call to say whether or not you, you, you would uh, accept that uh, range or not, okay? This is the control factor. This is, this is, the, uh, uh, this is the part of the process that you can say yes or no to. Going into any interview, you need to know two things. Number one, what do you know about the company? Still is the, still is the second most question or the second most popular question that you're, you're given. Um, I need you to also understand your personal market or your personal worth. And I need you to ask yourself these at least five questions. Do you, have you, have you inventoried or looked at the personal expenses that will manage the minimum part of the salary that you're looking for? And I need you to take a look at insurance, healthcare expenses, any sort of commute uh, uh, fuel. By the way, the average commute in the Dallas Metro, I'm sorry, 54 minutes is the average now commute one way, okay? Take a look at your mortgage expenses, take a look at your car expenses. All of these start building your 
understanding of what you think you can accept as a minimum part of the range? Are you willing to take a look at other positions? What do you mean by that, Rex? Rex, I was a account manager in another position. Would you accept a senior accountant position? Would you accept a senior financial analyst position? Would you accept a financial analyst position? And then uh, determine whether or not you would accept any other of, of those positions or maybe even a higher position. Maybe you were a director, maybe it's a VP, senior director. But be willing to take a look at other levels of, of uh, the position that you're looking for. Okay. Um, the second and third bullets are aligned. If you're looking at other levels of the position, do you understand the compensation for some of those positions as well? Let's say the accounting manager position, what, you, what your information said is that you're looking for 88, or I'm sorry, your data says that the senior manager in the Dallas Metroplex for the years of experience that you have is between 88.5K to 94.5K. Um, if you would look at an accountant position, would you take, a, uh, would you take that position earning 77K? You have to answer these questions. Uh, uh, as a recruiter, I'm not gonna answer these questions for you. You have to own this, you have to understand this, and with conviction and confidence, tell me what you think your market worth is, is, is going to be. I talked about this earlier. If you are looking to change industry, understand if that industry's compensation practice is a salary leader or a salary lagger. Uh, salary lagger, what are you talking about, Rex? Some industries that tend to lag the industries might be retail, might be mortgage, might be fast food, okay? Salary leaders, I mentioned those before, big four, DOD, um, uh, high level financial services, uh, could be high paying, I'm, I'm sorry, um, pharma, pharmaceuticals, life sciences, all of those tend to be salary leaders uh, in the compensation spaces. Are you willing to relocate to a cost of living that is lower or higher than what you're looking? If you're looking for positions, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area is not San Antonio, nor is that Birmingham, Alabama. So understand what cost of living you're, you're, you're looking at and how does that affect the type of salary range that you're looking for. I'm, uh, I've got about seven more minutes, then I'm gonna turn it over uh, to John to get to the next part of this presentation. The guiding principles, I want you to think of these practices going in. If you don't have to reveal your salary requirements early in the process, don't do it, okay? Let them, let them show you some love. Let them understand how great you are. Let them see you know, the awesomeness of your interviews. Okay. But my recommendation is that if you don't know the salary range by the third, what I call meaningful meet and interview, a phone call, on-site uh, meeting, if you don't know that, you need to ask because they might be hiding something from you. Okay. Again, you don't want to waste your time. You don't need to waste their time. Always, guys, bargaining in good faith. I can't tell you how much more sophisticated criminal background checks are. And the criminal background check can also include education. So um, uh, making certain that, that how you communicate is honest because that's how you want to be dealt with as well, honestly. Um, if you can, avoid HR and the recruiter. Network to the hiring authority as quickly as you can. I know that I'm a recruiter and it's okay with me if, if your relationship tells, tells you that you can get to the vice president of that organization and that hiring 
uh, in that hiring organization. Do so quickly. Um, if you can, interview your in, uh, schedule your interview faster than slower. What I mean is that if the hiring management gives you a agenda or a schedule or availability that says, I can interview you on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. What interview slot do you take? You take the fastest, earliest one that you can. And here's the reason why I've seen too many requisitions cancel in mid, uh, in mid interviewing process. The faster that you interview, the faster you might be able to get that offer. Okay. Uh, by the way, I've also seen hiring managers say that Rex, you've sent me eight great candidates. Uh, I, I, I saw Sean Montgomery today. He was out of sight. Cancel all my other interviews. I want to get Sean the, inter uh, the, the offer today. Okay. Schedule your interview faster than later in the process or slower in the process. Everyone will do their, um, should do their, uh, their homework on every company, right? You know the company that you're interviewing with because a question is going to be, what do you know about my company? Understand what their physical, their physical health is. And what I mean by that is, have they been winning in the market? Have they been losing money? Have they been letting people go? Have they been laying off a lot? Uh, what's the turnover for that organization? Knowing all those things, because over the last 90 days, guess what? The turmoil in this market has been violent. So you need to know how that organization is doing in terms of their, their physical health, physical health. Best offer, counter offer strategies that I can give the group. Rex, I got the offer, guess what? But it's lower than I want it. What can I do? What can I say to get a better offer? You can do on the first two bullets, you can compare either one of two things by industry comparison where you can go to the recruiter or the hiring manager and say, that, listen, I'm so, I'm so humbled to get the offer, but the position in doing, uh, doing the research has an average pay of $108,000. Can your offer come closer to that amount? Or you argue job and role comparison. This position usually has a pay rate of this, can your offer come close to that amount? Notice how I'm saying it. It's not, it's not demanding, it's humble, it's asking, okay? If they can't do better on salary, the best area that has more flexibility for the manager is PTO or vacation, asking for more PTO or vacation. The fourth area that I would uh, look for counteroffer, can you accelerate performance merit increase to six months versus the uh, versus 12 months. So what you're asking manager is that if I hit it out of the ballpark in six months, bet on yourself and say that, would you be okay if we approached each other or I approached you for an earlier performance uh, increase that is associated with a merit increase? If you don't want to do any of those four things, ask this question, last bullet. Can you do better with the offer? By the way, not 50%, not 60%, 70% of the hiring managers per Robert Half say that they're ready to negotiate with you. Ask the, uh, ask the last question, okay? Um, here are some of the things that you need to understand uh, on comp the employer's compensation upside. It revolves around health care. When does your insurance kick in? 30 days or 90 days? What does it cost to you? What does it cost for uh, your family? 401k contributions, incentives, uh, bonuses, um, commission. What's your uh, what's your educational reimbursement plan? What does that look like? How much do I get in the first year? And is there any sort of profit company stock 
uh, that might come with, uh, uh, with this position. All of these are questions that you should know before you get the offer, okay? Okay, here's my contact information. If you need, uh, if you would like to have uh, this slide set, just, uh, if, if, if you could just uh, uh, put it in chat or better yet, uh, I'm sorry, it's R-E-X-S-A-O-Y-T at gmail.com, okay? Send me your request, I'll get you this uh, slide set. Uh, and it's four o'clock right now, your time. I'm gonna turn it over to John to the uh, next part of the session. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much, Rex. A lot of good information in there. Um, uh, we do have um, let me let me get this done right. Okay, here we go. Okay. So, um, I'm going to uh, post this up here so everybody can see it. Well, um, when you were, Rex, when you were talking about um, some of the, at the beginning. Hi, my name is Steve Fisher, and I am oh, the pastor of Care Ministries that. at Stonebriar Community Hold Church. They've given me an opportunity today. Why is that doing that? Hmm. Huh. Let me uh, figure out how I can get rid of that. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Zoom, zoom. I love it. Uh, Rex, can you hear me? I sure can. Sorry about that. Um, earlier in your presentation, when you were talking about um, different industries, uh, the question came up um, about, you didn't mention healthcare. Do you have any, I know that, uh, do you have any information about what's going on in healthcare as far as avail opportunities yeah. and and the um, uh, uh, with with health healthcare, I know two things. Number number one, uh, one of the top three major healthcare carriers in the state laid off twelve hundred people, maybe thirteen hundred people. That was. Uh, Baylor, Scott, and White, okay? I don't know if it was layoff or furloughed, but, nev but nevertheless, um, it stung one of the organizations that I thought was, uh, was an organization that I didn't think would lay off to that sort of scale. The second thing, John, is that I have been seeing a lot of elective surgeries being scheduled. And with elective surgeries, that means that means healthcare is coming back, um, and and that 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 would include chiropractors, uh, uh, physical therapists, uh, elective surgeries, you know, for 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 other things as well. I I think I think it's going to come back really very very strong. Okay. And, yeah, well, they and healthcare usually pays well, and they have great insurance. Right. Um, agreed. Uh, healthcare is an ongoing thing that's never going to go away. Uh, what about the automotive industry was also asked. Chris Chung asked, and she's in Hawaii, by the way. 
Right, right. Um, I I think I think a lot of the recovery for uh, for the automotive industry uh, is going to be not as robust for the balance of 2020. Uh, and all I'm what what I'm looking at, John, is basically what are the new car sales looking like for the balance of the year. I'm not I'm not hearing overly great news about how Ford is doing, how how uh, Chevy or General Motors is doing, and how uh, some of the others uh, are, are are doing as well. So. Uh, that that industry space is, I, I think, just okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, uh, if you if you don't need health care insurance, can you negotiate for a better salary, Rex? I've seen, I, I, I've, I've heard that question as well many, 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 many times. 90% of the time, because healthcare insurance is what is called an institutional healthcare package in your benefits, I cannot, uh, uh, I, I, I can't take the money that you would say that I'm not, I'm not looking to pay for insurance. Can you give it to me in salary? Conservatively over the last 10 years, I've had to say no to that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Lori, can I jump in for a second? I think I've done this. I've negotiated that in the past, but I've always worked for small companies. When you work for a small company, you know, 50 employees, 25 employees, I think you have a bit more flexibility. If you're working for a giant company, you probably don't have that possibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, so a lot of factors, which is why, you know, all the presenters in the series, Rex included today, talked about doing the research. And, and so everybody knows, if you haven't seen it in the chat, uh, Jeff posted, um, a link to uh, a site on Nerd Wallet, uh, www.nerdwallet.com slash cost of living calculator. And why he posted that, Rex was talking about uh, if, if you're relocating, uh, if you're relocating to a smaller or third tier uh, metropolitan area that um, where the cost of living is not as high, or, or you're going from a cost, low cost of living area to a higher cost of living area, you can do that uh, research on places like this Nerd Wallet site so that you, you have valid information to be talking about uh, and how your needs, uh, how you can negotiate your salary based on the increased uh, cost of living. Okay. Um, Lori, I had a question for you. Um, let me find it here. Uh, let's see, how do you, uh, I'm gonna focus this to Lori because it involves the ATS system. Lori, how do you respond to the salary question on an ATS, especially if asked for a singular amount instead of a range? Um, that's a great question. I, and I'm not, it's kind of funny because I, I know we use it, you know, an applicant tracking system, of course, but I'm not sure exactly if ours even asks for that. I'd rather yeah. default that to, Rex probably can answer this question better than me. Mm -hmm. Um, lateral pass, Rex. <laughs> the answer to my question leads to this. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, here's, here's what I'm recommending. What are you trying to get to? 
you're trying to get to at least the offer uh, to the offer, which means that you're trying to get to the interview. My recommendation is to give a salary that will get you or show competitiveness in the market for that position. For me, I would give uh, I would give a salary closer to the minimum of the salary range that you're looking for, John. But you have to the candidate has to know if I I'm going to hold you to that. Okay. Where I've rec that's where I have now recommended you to my manager. So deal with me in good faith. If, if you say 82K, I'm going to hold you to that now for those ATMs that will only show, hey, what is, what is your minimum salary expectation? Okay. Um. Uh, Lori, I'm going to... Um, have you seen any increase in more postings or hiring activity over the past week? As a matter of fact, my experience, I would say yes. Here, um, in fact, just today, I want to say I've seen and received three new, three new jobs that we've been asked to recruit on, which doesn't sound like a lot. But in the past three months, I can't say that we've had three new jobs received, that we've had three new jobs received in one day. So mm. that's a good thing. Yeah. I would say, I'm just gonna add in the tech space, um, I'm not seeing a lot of, not a lot of unemployed IT professionals. A lot of folks still seem to be doing fairly well um, for the most part, at least for the types of positions that I recruit for here in Dallas. But I think it's, I think things are looking a little bit better. Okay, well, great. That's good to hear. It is. Uh, of, of course, you know, all of those, all of those observations are uh, present uh, situations and it could change tomorrow. This thing is so volatile and so flexible that that's why Steve talked about discouragement and whatnot uh, because things are things are changing from the way they were and some things will go back, some things won't, some things will change again in all facets of our lives. So um, yeah, it, it, flexibility and 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 uh, Perseverance are the two things that are probably the most important now. Um, John, can I can I leverage on what uh, um, what Lori just said? Sure. Uh, I, I saw an analysis about four or five days ago from the vice president of Manpower North America, saying that they had an uptick of ten percent in job postings oh. last month. Good. That was in May. Yeah. Okay. I mean, now is the time for everybody to have four things done. Have your resume fine-tuned. Have your LinkedIn profile fine-tuned and make sure that you make it easy for people to reach out via email or phone numbers, being able to easy for them to find you. Number three, get your interviewing skills ready to go because when they do call you, there's not going to be a second chance for you to blow that interview, to blow that phone call. Be prepared figure out what it is you need to say, uh, practice your star stories or raw stories or whatever you use. And number four, now's the time to be networking with people doing information interviewing so that when a position opens up, they may think about you if you've built a relationship with somebody at a company. Excellent point, excellent point. Okay. Um, There, there, there was a comment. Uh, I would advise everybody to please scan the chat. Uh, Ellen, Ellen Levitt, uh, Ellen Beth Levitt, 
made a comment, not a question, on hospitals and physician offices if you're in healthcare and gave a link to an article about it that she's written. Uh, so please Ooh. scan. I'm sorry. Somebody say something? Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Okay. That was uh, Elvin Beth Levitt uh, posted uh, something in the chat. If you're inter if you're in healthcare, so I would I would encourage everybody to explore uh, the chat because people not uh, may not be asking questions, but they're offering suggestions and and helpful comments uh, that uh, might benefit you. Uh, some people have asked also about uh, when Rex was talking about negotiation uh, of the different benefits that that a position might um, offer. Uh, someone talked about the cell phone allowance, uh, health club fitness reimbursement, um, and and uh, continuing education. So um, there are lots of opportunities to keep the conversation going uh, until you can get to a point where you feel uh, satisfied uh, with the outcome of the conversation. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any more recent questions. Jeff, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, Foster has gone from the call. Lori, did you have any uh, any additional comments on what Rex presented today? No, I think all of it was incredibly great information and spot on. So I hope it was helpful for everybody. Wow. Oh, no doubt it was because I, Rex always touches in this topic on, uh, he goes deeper than, than uh, I know he goes deeper than I remember thinking through when I was thinking about, well, what are they going to offer me? Uh, I didn't see it as a negotiation. I saw it as a, um, well, let's see what they've got to offer. And if I can live with that, yes, or can't live with that or whatever. So um, yeah. um, there's th some very, very creative ways to, to manage that conversation. Uh, John, I've got, I've got a specific question for uh, Jeff. Uh, is it worth it to pay a resume service to do my resume? No, I wouldn't spend the money. I mean, we're lucky here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area to have so many great resources, people who are willing to look at your resume, people who are willing to offer the suggestions. But just remember that if you ask 10 people for their opinions, you're going to get about 15 different answers. So <laughs> just have to sort of pick and choose what works. Well, Lori's down here laughing, I see. But I mean, you know, you just have to... Pick and see what works, what doesn't work, and what you feel comfortable with. But to me, the most important thing about your resume, I think, is you should have a master resume, 10 pages, 15 pages long, with everything you've ever done since you scooped ice cream in high school, with bullet points, 10 or 15 bullet points on everything you've ever done. And then when you see a job description, you go and eliminate everything that is not on the job description. This way you don't have to think about, wait, you know, I think I did that back in 1990 or whatever. You know, if you have that master resume, you can easily just wipe everything away that's unimportant and you make it so easy that when Lori sees your resume, she goes, yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for to fill this slot. I would, I would add to that comment, Jeff, is, is uh, ask rather than pay, uh, ask other people, but particularly recruiters and hiring managers uh, and people in uh, whose, whose occupation, whose professional occupation is in the HR arena uh, to get the most valid feedback. Um, and of course, as on careerdfw.org, all the Zoom meetings that are going on now and all the uh, instructional pieces, there's a lot going on with resumes. So um, good places to get information on that. 
two other words I want to throw in sort of, you know, Rex's statement when you're talking about a salary, uh, you know, his comment sort of, there's two, two things that I like to either use. Number one is, well, according to salary.com and the Department of Labor and Statistics, a pay range for this position in this area is somewhere between 60 and $90,000. I'm sure that whatever you're going to pay is going to be fair and equitable. How can a company argue with that? You know, oh, we don't pay fair and equitable wages. Okay, well, thanks, interview's over. So you may want to sort of consider those two words, fair and equitable, uh, to add to your uh, negotiation or when they ask for a, a price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to make it fun, if those of you who've seen Steve Zipkoff, he will go and say, well, my manufacturer's suggested retail price is $125,000 a year. Now, I can't work for free and nobody pays full price, so I'm sure we can come up with something that's fair and equitable. Now, if you make him laugh, like Lori just laughed, uh, I think that, you know, if you build something with, you know, the interview when you do that, if you can sort of make it sort of funny. So, I've used it in the past. I actually used it at a job interview once in the past, and I got a giggle out of the interviewer. Didn't get the job, but I got a giggle. Very good. Okay. Um, I'm not coming up with any further questions. Does anybody have, uh, you should have a raise hand um, on, your, on your participant screen. If you open up your participant screen down at the bottom, usually there's an icon to raise your hand to ask a question. If you'd like to do that, we can call on you. And I've got one from, from Dolores. Laura's gone. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. So um, what I, I, it's not really a question, but just sort of an observation. Whenever I'm looking at a job uh, that I'm interested in, I try to look at the company and look at their About Us page to figure out the tone of um, what they're selling. So if their tone is casual and buddy-buddy, I try to match my uh, cover letter to that same tone. Um, and if it's something super serious and buttoned up, um, I match my cover letter to that type of tone too. Thank you. That's very good. Uh, David Williams. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, Rex for that, that great presentation. I just want to emphasize something that Rex said um, a couple of years ago when I uh, interviewed for a new organization. Um, I went from being a contractor to a full-time individual and I was they made me an offer and I was very very reluctant in countering uh, because I always had the fear that it would come across as a negative uh, thing um, and it turns out it, it wasn't it worked everything worked out great um, I think a lot of people have that fear right Rex of it being negative against them uh, yep. when in fact it, it's really a, I think a something that's positive that they appreciate yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, um, people on this call know what a good recruiter is and what a bad recruiter is. One of the, one of the things that regardless of the outcome, what I want to come out with is a really honest, straight, good relationship with you. Because if I called you once, I might call you in the next two or three months or even two or three weeks. That has happened to me before. So, if, if, we can, if we can get to that level of understanding where I could be straight, stone cold honest with you, and you're willing to accept that, then uh, I, I, th that's a great building foundation to, to have, David. Great. I've got a question for Rex and for Lori, both of them, since this is what you do every day. Um, when you're negotiating, do you negotiate with the hiring manager or with HR who sent you the proposal? The, as a matter of fact, that happened two weeks ago with me. I knew that the, that the individual, uh, the, the hiring manager that I was representing could only go to 65K. That was the budget, Jeff. 
when all was said and done, we wanted the candidate, we wanted him super badly. I came back at him at a 75K offer, which was 15% higher than what he had, and we got the deal done. You, you would be amazed how many hiring managers and you're hiring, there's a lot of hiring managers on this call where you guys have told your recruiters, I want this individual to come in happy. If it takes two more thousand, three more thousand, give it to him or her, okay? As a recruiter, I tell my manager, expect, expect a negotiation with this candidate because they're that good. And they say, yeah. Lori? Yeah, I would agree. I've had that happen here as a corporate recruiter. So I do a little of both. Like we do hire employees to our company, but then we also have clients sometimes that will ask that we recruit candidates for them. Um, so internally as a corporate recruiter, I have definitely had that happen where like Rex said, we've had a candidate that we really, really, really want and they're outside of the salary band, but we're still in the ballpark, if you will. And so um, my manager came back and said, well, how about if we offer them, just like Rex mentioned, if we offer to do a performance appraisal or a performance review in six months, and if that goes well, then we'll take them up to their requested requested salary, which I think I want to say was five or six thousand dollars more. And we did do that, and we still have that employee today. Um, and um, so we, yes, so sometimes you can, you know, certainly negotiate um, negotiate those salaries, even if they sometimes are outside the salary band. Every case can't, you know, is different. Um, it just depends. And then sometimes I work with hiring managers at the client sites and it may or may not be negotiable. But as a recruiter, like Rex said, um, you know, the good ones versus the bad ones. I mean, for me, it's a role where I am acting as your advocate. So I, I do want to bring you in best foot forward. So I will go and try to say, hey, you know, is there something we can do here? Do we have any room? You know, can we offer them more PTO? Can we do this? You know, and, and just look at the look at the and explore the different options. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Um, but a lot of times the candidates will work with me as well. And because a lot of times they want the job just as much as we want them. So hopefully we can come to that mutual that mutual agreement. That sweet spot. That sweet, yeah, that sweet spot. And then sometimes, you know, you, I'll talk to candidates and they're, you know, they're so far above or past what we can offer. And I will just tell them that because as Rex pointed out early in the presentation, I don't want to waste their time. You know, can I keep them in mind for future opportunities? Absolutely. And at least I know, you know, what range they're looking for. So that's certainly an option. Thanks, Lori. Well, we're coming up to the end here and, um, I just can want I answer. To... Can I answer one question that uh, uh, that Ellen Beth uh, mm -hmm. gave, a and she said, "Should you ask the recruiter what the salary is before giving your salary range?" For the good recruiters, I will share truth with you, okay? Because why I, regardless of the outcome, I want to have a great relationship with you. I will tell mm -hmm. you the salary range. A lot of recruiters are forbidden to tell you the salary range. So I've seen, I've seen the dance. I said, well, what are you looking for? And then the person says, well, what are you looking for? And then I say, well, what are you looking for? Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't need to get, I don't need to get into that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that circular run with you. I'll tell you what my salary range is. Okay. But here's a hidden secret. I probably have anywhere between two to 5% of play on the upside of that salary that I'm giving you, because why I want to have that as an incentive for you to accept the offer. If you tell me, Rex, you're low about 3000. Can you do better? Just to let you know. Yeah. And, and, and Rex, 
interesting now sometimes I will do that but I am cautious sometimes I won't even get people on the phone and their first question back to me in writing without even discussing the position is what is the salary or what is the range? And in those cases, I will tell you, I am hesitant or reluctant. I don't know that this is the case, but for me, it makes me question, is it just, is the person just interested in money? Is that their top motivator? So yeah. So in that situation now, if I've worked with someone before, and I've talked to them and I've got a history and we have a trusted relationship, I will likely very well, very much tell them. And so it's, you it just, yeah, yeah. I just have to use sometimes my, my best judgment. All right. Well, thank you, Lori. And thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Rex. Uh, it's 4.30. We're going to close up now. I would like to close this in a short word of prayer and uh, send everyone on their way. So dear Heavenly Father, uh, you know our needs, you know our desire for employment, for work, and uh, work that we enjoy doing for the next step in our careers to present itself. I pray that you would guide all these people as they continued on this part of their journey. May they focus first on your will for their lives, putting your desires in your, uh, uh, above, uh, their own and open doors to new opportunities uh, that you desire for them and equip them with the skills, knowledge, and wisdom they need to take the steps forward in this process. And we thank you for our panel and their contribution, their sacrifice of time and talent and energy to help others. And we, uh, we thank you for all that in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you.